Well, hello there, my brothers and sisters. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Image of Churchianity is a Lie. Thank you for joining me today. If this is your first time, welcome. Hey, more than anything, you need to know that you've been 100% reconciled to God. That He's not taking account of your sins. He's not even looking at your sins. He never would, because if He looked at your sins, then you'll turn and look at your sins. And then you'll trust your sins rather than Him as to whether or not you've been reconciled. See, we the wool's been pulled over our eyes, and the church system has taught us not to trust believe, or believe Jesus. That we keep, we're told that He's looking at our sins, that He's worried about us going to heaven or hell, that that all this stuff. There's still all these questions left unanswered. There's still stuff left to do. You've got to accept, repent, do something, like it hasn't already been done. See, when you finally realize that you're you're working against yourself. You called yourself naked. You judge yourself carnally. You are your own worst enemy because of the sin in you. Your second worst enemy is going to be Satan, who accuses you nonstop. And your third most enemy is going to be the church, and all religions for that matter, and philosophies, and people's opinions. But they claim to be of God, but teach you to deny Him, to deny His victory, deny His absolute overcoming of everything which would keep you outward in death and dependent upon them, right? So um, I want you to redefine what death and hell are, what heaven is, and what, what the eternal life is and all that stuff. Uh, real quickly, just to keep you in context here. Life is being connected to God. He is the source of all life. If you connect to Him, you live with Him. As long as He lives, the quality of life that He lives... The righteousness he has, everything has been imputed to you if you connect to him. And that's what marriage is the picture of, right? On the other hand, if you separate from him, then you're in this place called death. The de the end of death is called hell or the grave. That's all it is. It means you'll cease to exist. So you don't have life in yourself. So you couldn't burn in hell forever unless God kept you alive, which he wouldn't do. You know what I'm saying? You, you, there's no way that God would leave you unto going to hell or to sustain your life in a position of perpetual torture. That just wouldn't happen. And on top of that, he died in your place so that your sins have already been paid for. There, There's nothing excluding you from the kingdom except for your own opinions, your own understanding, your own images, your own works and efforts at trying to be good exclude you from entering in because you have to enter by faith. And faith means that you receive everything that he's given to you. You have a very big Jesus the church system has a very small Jesus, and his name's actually Satan in disguise. And I want you guys to know this. The only way you'll come home is if you are upright, if you are sinless, without conscience of sin. So that you know between you and God that there is no, no death, debt left unpaid, that you're totally welcomed, you're, you're encouraged, you're, you're absolutely in the beloved. Not just you didn't just barely cross the line, you're in the full place as a, as a bride because of what Christ has done. <clears throat> Excuse me. So from this point forward, you have to live as though there is no more hell. There is no more death. There is no more nothing waiting for you. It is only the reconciliation, the kingdom, and the love of God that is awaiting you now. And that's it. So I know it's very tempting to look at your surroundings and say, well, Christ couldn't have come back or he couldn't be here because look around you, all this bad stuff going on. Well, that's because you've been tricked to look at the wrong place. You have to look in the Spirit and understand what He has said is true. And if the kingdom is here, the kingdom is here. But if you believe Him, you'll experience the kingdom. I mean, belief unlocks everything, just so you know. And belief is not something you can do by yourself. It's a gift from God. Neither is faith. You can't generate your own faith. If it was true, you could have all faith, right? Paul on the road to Damascus would have not need for Christ to intervene, right? Because he would have already been able to, by his free will, accurately locate Christ, ac accurately know him, and repent to him. But as it was, he in spent his entire life thinking he was serving God and was really Satan. Christ said it to the Pharisees. He said, your father is the devil. You are of your father. He was a liar from the beginning. Because they don't realize that all their efforts are trying to be good are false. They're lies. Because God sees through all that anyway. Why would you try to pretend? Why would you think you needed to? In a Bible study a long time ago, I asked a man, I said, how would you, if, if, how could you make everyone stop lying forever without even trying? 
And he's like, oh, well, you know, you, you just force them to or you threaten them or whatever. And I'm like, that doesn't work. That causes people to lie. What you got to do is convince them there's no more reason to lie. There's no one chasing you. There's no one condemning you but you, you guys. It's because in your conscience you are condemned. So you flee when no one is pursuing you. You run away from a God who is not mad at you. You and your mistaken imagination because you judge yourself carnally and according to your own images have judged yourself unworthy. Or what's worth, what's worse is you've judged yourself worthy by your own works. <laughs> your humility is to everything but God, right? You don't believe him. You don't trust him. You don't put any effort to even understand him because you've cut yourself off and isolated yourself from the only source of life. Now you are in sin and death. You are in the, in the, you're out here outside of God and outside of life. You're in this place of death. And all of your works will just, which will, the wages of sin is death. You'll, that's all, from all these works and everything you're doing, the only thing you're going to earn is to cease. Go to the grave. That's it. That's futile. All these church systems, all these buildings, all these pastors, all these seminaries, all these missionaries, everything is futile. It just goes right to death. Because first of all, they're not teaching you the right gospel. They're not teaching you to trust Jesus. When you hear the gospel, the right response would be peace and joy and refreshing and release. But as it is, the church reminds you of your sins. Satan captured all the Israelites, in the, in, or as Pharaoh did. But it's a picture of Satan, how Satan gets us. Is What he did is he took certain of their brethren, appointed them over the top of the rest of them, and then through them increased their burdens. So if, if increasing burdens is what puts you into bondage, how do you feel today? Do you feel like your burdens are light? Christ's yoke is easy and his burden is light? I guarantee you have a yoke on that you can barely even carry. It's weighing you down. Especially if you're a child of God and you've genuinely assented unto God. You want to serve him with all your heart and you've, you've decided you want to follow him. Well, the only thing that is holding you back is you're looking at your own sin. Determining your own value and worth by your own external observations rather than what Christ paid for you. It's all in your head, you guys. So the reality and the truth is that Christ has reconciled everything and not just from the cross. The cross is only the testimony of what had already been done before the foundation of the world. So Christ has legally purchased all of the possession, everything. We just have not seen the redemption yet. And that's coming. And you will, you will be with him wherever he is. And that's going to be life, you guys. You're, you might go to the grave, but he'll resurrect you and he, you will be cleaned and you will be put into life. You'll go to sleep. You might. I think we're in the generation, though, that there's going to be a lot of us that will not see, will not go to sleep. We will keep, we'll keep going right on to eternal life. Then the twinkle of an eye, we shall be renewed. So anyway, that being said, um, we I just went with Second Thessalonians. Now we're going to go into Timothy. Um, Timothy is going to say a lot of, th or I mean, Paul to Timothy is going to say a lot of things that are going to be very hard to swallow for someone who is still carnal, who is still trying to measure themselves by themselves or others as to whether or not they're good enough for God, rather than hearing the word that you are, that God is already pleased with you because of what Christ has done. And that you, by faith, appropriate that righteousness and come home as if you'd never sinned. You're commanded to not look at your sins anymore. You're commanded to look at Him. Like the serpent on the pole in the wilderness, whenever they were bitten by the snakes, if anyone was to be healed, all they simply had to do was to turn and look at the, the, golden, or the brazen serpent that uh, Moses lifted up for them. So any of you who have been bitten by the sting of death, all you have to do to be healed is turn and look at Jesus it because the serpent on the poles is, is symbolic of him he who knew no sin went on a cross and died for our on our behalf you guys so that he took the penalty for sin that we would be his righteousness so that's what his body was for and that's why god became flesh so that he himself could live the sinless life that he could be the propitiation and the atonement and the expiation for our sins that he could accomplish it. And then once he did that, everything being made subject to himself, then he could come back in us as the Holy Spirit. And through that, lift us up to him. God does never sit up there and say, come here, you worthless person. Come here, I'm going to throw you into hell. He doesn't do that. He both empowers you and gives you the will to come to come forth. 
Let him come home. He never threatens you. If he did, if he reminds you of your sins, he's contrary to himself. Because if he reminds you of your sins, you'll look at them, not him. So we know that you think that you're being convicted by the Holy Spirit and reminded of your sins. That is Satan. You're tricked. It's your own flesh. It's your own mind. It is not God. The Holy Spirit would never point to your sins. Okay? Okay, well, let's start off. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of our Savior, of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. And hope isn't just like, oh, maybe I'm going to be saved. Oh, this is good luck. Or hope means you're absolutely firm and established. The word hope is is concrete. It's not like we have this, oh, I hope someday maybe we can go to Disneyland. You have this uh, this hope that possibly, or that it's likely, you know, that's not the fact. Whenever you think hope, you're thinking hope is the future tense of faith, and faith is the absolute conviction that Christ has done everything. And if everything is good, then in the future tense, you know everything will be great. And you don't guess it, and you're not kind of, hoping that someday it comes to pass, you're actually standing on the hope of the rock. Okay? So, unto Timothy, mine own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because grace, mercy, and peace are what fuels us to perform God's work. And that's why the good news, the gospel, that your sins have been taken away will fuel you to do the works of righteousness. Because your sin being removed, you now are righteous and you will come back to God and link with him and then you will take the power of an endless life to do your works rather than beating yourself up and guilting yourself up to death. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. Let me see, make sure. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus while I went into Macedonia that you might uh, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Our doctrine is Christ. When I, when I look at you, the way I know that you are absolutely saved is because Jesus Christ has risen and ascended and taken you with him. There is no other thing. I don't, there's no other charge I'm going to lay to you. There's no other charge laid to me. He says, neither, neither give heed to fables such as like hell and the endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. And that's why we really sh- try to get, not get in these arguments. Just profess what you know. Don't worry about the other part. God will God will enlighten all of us in his own due time. We don't need to argue one with another and to argue doctrine in any way. You know, I mean, if the Lord leads you to, then do it by all means. Because some people, that is their job, you know. But don't, don't feel like you have to argue anything. Just preach what you do know. And then the Lord will, will, will make the increase of the rest. Okay? Um, ba 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 now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Now, this charity is a big word. It's the agape, which is going to be um, the, the uh, what do you call it? unconditional love. And unconditional love is not where you're overpowered by someone. God doesn't look at us and go, oh, we're so beautiful that he can't live without us. That's not what he does. He sees us with everything we are, and he's made the commitment to love us through thick or thin. It's the, it's the wedding vows that we have. That is the agape, right? That we love ourselves in sickness and in health till death do us part, right? So, um, and then of good conscience. So out of a pure heart, which is one that is not, you're not lusting for desiring for anything because your heart has been purified, sanctified. You're pure. You don't need anything because you're full with the Holy Spirit, right? You're not trying to gain righteousness. You're not trying to get a name for yourself. You don't care because Christ has given you more. You know, we, you know, Mike and I were talking yesterday or today, and we're talking about how we do this stuff, and, and we get paid more than anyone could ever know. I mean, and the fact that we get this peace and this joy and everything else that we get by serving other people, they wouldn't be tangible things like finances and money and, and things like that, but the things that, that all the money in the world can't buy, which is peace and joy and, and rest. And, we, you know, it was just laughing because I'm watching the video of us two together and we're these big older dudes and we're giggling like little schoolgirls laughing about this because it's so much fun because we, we're so pumped about the Lord. You know what I mean? Because we see how good he is. You know? He says, uh, and a faith unfeigned. So where you're not trying to act like you have faith, if you don't have faith, then draw nearer into the word. Ask people to show you the truth. Because faith just comes by hearing, hearing the word. 
the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's it. You can't exercise it. You can't develop it yourself. Otherwise, you would have already, all right? Um, it's just by hearing the word and being washed continually. That's all it is. Um, it says, from which having swerved, or having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. And that vain jangling is doing stuff that is just futile. Going back to dependence on your flesh and works like they ever worked or could have worked. That they never were killing you and, and wiping you out and making you completely unfruitful. You know what I mean? Desiring to be teachers of the law. Understanding neither what they say nor whether they have a, a, what they affirm. So he's like, they're just going in, in ignorance. It's like James when he says, whoever looks into, the, into the, the mirror of the law and they go about to try to be dependent upon the law, they forgot what they look like. They, 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 they forgot that the law reveals that you are incapable of, of upholding the law. But the mirror, when you look in the mirror and you forget, you don't forget what you look like, then you've, you've entered into the perfect law of liberty because you know you can't do anything for God. You can't do anything. One thing. It's all by him, for him. is done and it's settled and tied up. Our only job now is just letting everybody know the truth. All right? But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, and for them that devile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be anything that is contrary to sound doctrine. So what he's saying, if you're still, if you're still dependent upon the law, your conscience bears all these things. You're still convicted as all these things because the law is there to manifest these things. If you're still, if you don't follow the law out of a pure heart, you follow the law out of a guilty conscience. That's what the law was for in the Old Testament. It was to to reveal to you how you had sinned, so because your conscience was vexed, it reveals why your conscience was vexed, and then the blood sacrifice was to remove that vexation, so that you could re, you could remain sinless before God and remain in fellowship with Him. So we have Jesus as that eternal blood sacrifice. So the law has been fulfilled. So we know we confess our sins. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness, even as he himself is pure. And it's continuing. We don't have to wait once a year. We can do it every minute, every second, anytime we have need, right? <clears throat> so those of us who are now sinless because we have no confidence in our flesh, we don't look at ourselves anymore. We don't look and compare ourselves to anything other than what Christ has said and who he is as the establishment of our walk, our righteousness, our daily living, our worthiness, our holiness. Everything is depend up and bound up in Him. And then, uh, anything that is contrary to sound doctrine. And again, if you add anything to Christ, if you tell someone, oh, well, yeah, yeah, Christ might have saved you, but you got to believe, accept, repent. You, any little thing you add like that, you have just counted yourself as an offender and a Judaizer. And you've excluded yourself from the kingdom, and you went and you've stayed in outer darkness because you've never entered in. You stayed in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, and that's the evidence that you're weeping and you're gnashing your teeth is the fact that you are still conscious of your sins, fighting to achieve righteousness, pushing God's hand away for your own effort. That will lead you to death, one hundred percent of the time. He says, according to the glorious good news of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He doesn't, not by men, not by his Pharisees, not by any other reason. He had to go be torn down and rebuilt and, and stand on nothing but the authority of Christ. It was given unto him. Whether men approve that authority or acknowledge that authority, because I'm going to tell you right now, it's just like Patrick says, you know, is he's really good at this. That he appropriated. I'm a son of God. I stand on that authority. And other and people who are still carnal and they're all line upon line, they won't understand that at all. They it'll just infuriate them because they're going to think it's blasphemy to them, and it is. I mean, to the, those that are still carnal. But to those who are of the Spirit, that's the only evidence we'll accept. Because one is trying to say, I figured this out. I've put this together with my own intellect. And my studying and hours of doing these things and what makes sense according to my common sense. Well, we know the end of that is death. <laughs> We've all experienced that. We don't, we don't honor that. That's like fake currency. That's like monopoly money to us. 
The real money is those who have witnessed the Lord and have the audacity to stand on His Holy Spirit. And then you'll see with them there'll be the joy and the peace and everything that is supposed to be present with somebody who knows Christ. Right? He says, He put me in the mystery who was before a blasphemer and a perjurer and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And whether he did it ignorantly or, you know, knowingly, he still would have obtained that relief or the, the mercy. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So he, the way the Lord deals with stuff is that you are a piece of shit and you are evil. The way he changes you, he loves you. <laughs> he loves the hell out of you. Literally, he loves the, all that shit out of you. What was corrupting you, that death and that that bile, that nasty shit in you, he just purges it with his love and mercy. Poof. That's why you're a new creation. You're a new man because he has purged all that guilt and that shame that was corrupting you and twisting you. It's gone. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all expectation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. Um, how many men were sinners? Oh, all, right. This is going to get a little touchy for you who are carnal and those that are still haven't seen this truth. This part, then it's going to get reaffirmed in four. So right now they're going to see something big and then it's going to get, I think in two and in four, you're gonna, it's going to develop. And it, it's like he's trying to give you a little spoonfuls at a time before he puts the, he puts the knockout blow on you. So um, he, says, uh, he says, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ came to in the world to save sinners who I am chief. So he's saying, I am beyond any sinner. You're, it's like, that's good news for you because if he saved me, you're, you mean, what are you worried about, right? How be it for this cause? Um, I obtain mercy. That in me, first, Jesus Christ may show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which hereafter would believe on him to life everlasting. Seeing that, so Christ, Paul was so reprobate in truth, and he's not being exaggerating here. He was very reprobate. He was exactly opposite to God, right? And uh, he said that he saved me, the worst of all sinners, so that you can trust, and, and after a pattern for you to know that. Even no matter how bad you are, it's all done. It's never. It was never about how good or bad you are. It's about Christ's mercy, His election, His calling. It's about His plan. Now unto the King Eternal, immortal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And it, what He's putting forth is that everything in futility and death is worthless. The only thing that matters is immortality, and that's where Christ He has it. He's the only thing not futile in all of existence, right? So, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on, on thee, that you by them might war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made a shipwreck. And so, people don't realize it is your conscience. This is the very place to where we'll make or kill you. If in your conscience you're vexed and flayed and you are conscious of your sin, you will not attach to God. You will not come back. You have to lay down your sin, your sinful conscience. You have to receive that you are sinless before the Lord and live like it. Okay? Oh, and it, so, and then holding faith in Christ, not your own works. You see what I'm saying? Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, who am I have delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So if he's throwing them over to Satan, Satan does a job. It's kind of like the church. They do a job. They don't realize the job they're doing. They think they're doing something else. But it's, it's for the destruction of the flesh, you guys. <clears throat> because that's what all this is for. All your good deeds and bad deeds, all the ups and downs in your lives, all the good and bad times you've had, all the good and evil things you've done. Every little thing that has ever happened to you, God has kept you in disbelief and blind for a reason. So that you could see how far you can go with your own strength. So to the end that you may deny the flesh. That you can have no confidence in your own strength, your own understanding, your own ability in any way. That you can finally surrender to Him and receive the gift. You know, Mike and I were talking about Job. 
and the book of Job, the first 32, the 31 chapters, whenever the Job's arguing back and forth with his friends, you know, you see the very beginning, we know what happens, it's all set up for us, and what happens in the, but um, we see that his friends were accusing him according to carnal things, and then he was defending himself according to car- carnal things, but then when you get to 32, Elihu steps in, and he's a Christophany. And he breaks it down and says, you had nothing to do with this. God does what he wants. He's God. It's all according to his plan. And once you see that transition from 32 on, you're, you're going to see what I'm saying. And you'll go, oh my God. It has nothing to do with me. It's all him. Holy shit. And then if it's all him, he is 100% victorious. And I just share that victory with him. Because he gives it to me for free. For nothing. After many, 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 many sins. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we all may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. And to come under the knowledge of the truth. And then you hear all these religious people. See, he wills that. But that's his passive will, not his real will. Well, let's just move on a little. Because this is his will. And this is will happen. But I'm going to confirm it. I'm going to put a nail in this in your coffin for this one. In just two, like two sentences. You're going to see. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay? We might not have enough evidence to go right here and say, Oh, yeah, well, that's all men. Which, even though it says all men. I mean, you have to do some mental gymnastics to get around all men. But let's just go a little further. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified of in due time. So this is angering to people who are still carnal. Because they're like, oh, I see, I believed, I did something for God that he has to reward me. It's like, me. you guys don't get it. And those poor sinners over there, they didn't. They're just living willfully in their sins. And I, I sacrificed and I'm living this godly life for God. He's like, shut the fuck up. You guys are so stupid. Everything is a gift from God. You have not served him. You are actually the reason why those sinners haven't come back. Because they have blasphemed the name of the Lord because of you. Because you've lied. You've, you've hid the gospel from them. You perverted it. You added to it. You leavened it. If anyone is to blame, it's you who claim to be a Christian and shut the door. You yourself stand on the outside of the kingdom, preventing them from coming even to the door because you're distracting them and denying the fact that Christ purchased them with his own blood while they were enemies to him. And as that, that the whole process is that Christ brings them in, then cleans them. He doesn't clean them, then bring them in. Anyway. <clears throat> so, anyway, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified of in due time. We just haven't seen it yet. It hasn't been testified of yet. But it will be. And if this still isn't enough for you, wait till we get to chapter 4. <clears throat> Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. So we have the, let's just start this. So the first thing he says, this is, you know, faithful saying that Christ saves sinners. Who I'm the chief. So that it will be a pattern for those that are following, right? This one it says right here, for it is good acceptable in sight of God our Savior who will have all men. Wait till we get to four. It's going to be saying, it's going to, he's going to include it the same thing. He's going to preface it with this. Watch. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So knowing that there's no doubt that you've been done, that Christ has done everything. No terror, no wavering, no back and forth. Christ is confirmed the King of Kings. <laughs> So, the lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becomes women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. See, the silence for a woman seems to be very, very precious before God. And I'm sorry, ladies, but as a husband, I can tell that, I can tell you that's very precious. <laughs> silence. Sometimes. Um, let women learn to be in subjection, silence with all subjection, and I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And, you know, the, it is really a big deal, and I've noticed in my wife, and most all women, 
women are really super, totally, horribly selfish until they have children. You know, and I noticed that when I was single that all the better women were the women that had kids, but they had kids, so I couldn't date them, you know. It was like all that baggage, you know. I noticed that before. And my wife has grown leaps and bounds since she's had kids. She's, she, you know what I mean? It just, it's really cool. But, and I'm just wondering if that's tied into it. You women might have a better uh, understanding of it since it is you, um, you know. But anyway, um, anyway, but I think that's cool that if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And that's, that's really cool. Um, and then let's go on to chapter three. Um, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, <clears throat> vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, hospitality, apt to teach. And that's not talking about a man who's never been divorced. Back then, polygamy was a deal, and you want to make sure it was a man who was, who was showing forth the image of God and his design for marriage. Um... Not given to wine, nor striker, nor greedy of filthy lucre. You know, not, you know, he's not looking for any prestige. Not a brawler, not covetous. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So this is one that, you're, you know, your kids, they need to know that daddy's daddy. And if you, you get a little bit out of hand, daddy's got the big hand. One that rules his own, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he shall fall into condemnation of the devil. And see, this is guy. This guy's not a simp. He will tell people when he sees something evil, and he'll stand in the gap, no matter the consequences, whether they like him or not. He'll stand. And this is the kind of guy I would love to be. I don't know if I am, but I mean, I, I see this trait in like, uh, you know, really strong in like Patrick, um, because he'll just tell you how it is, and I really respect that about him. Um, you know. Uh, for if a man, no, 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 not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without. And that not being a novice means somebody needs to be full grown and being tempered by the Holy Spirit. You can tell when somebody is, is being governed by the Holy Spirit versus they're, they're still wavering in and out. And you can't have somebody that's wavering, uh, leading or being a representation of your body. That's why I don't let people in, just everyone into that, that discord group. You have to display to me, um, uh, that you have a working understanding of the Lord and you're you're committed to Him. Um, you know what I mean. And and these guys have been doing a really good job of cutting people off that are just here to be argumentative or ask holes. They just ask and ask and ask and never contribute. You know, and never never take it to heart and never apply it to their lives. So anyway, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and in, in the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy, no filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. This is a big deal. You have to do everything from a pure conscience. You believe your sins are gone. Um, and let those also first be proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased of themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so I don't even know the bishop and the deacons. I have not had the revelation on that yet, how this operates in God's church. I've seen what the they how they are in the real churches and are the ones like the the churches of the world, not the real ones, but and that's bullshit. The, the those people are actually the the psychopaths typically, the ones that are desiring control, they're assholes. So anyway, I just if you guys have a, a good uh, I haven't had a clear revelation on that yet. So if you guys do, share it, please. Okay. Um, for, the, da, 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 for these things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, that you may know how, the, the, how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And this is really cool, because they, didn't, they weren't in houses. He was talking about the believers in the house of God, just being in the presence of other believers. That this is how we live and walk, and we we're respectful and honest and and encouraging to one another. Okay, um, but this is how we we behave soberly. Um, you know, as far as we know what the battle is, we are always got. It's like remember whenever uh, whenever they're rebuilding in Ezra's temple or Nehemiah's temple, 
and the builders had a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other. They were always concerned with the business, and they might have been jesting, and they might have had fun with each other, and you know, threw water on each other and had a good time every now and then. But they knew what the battle was. They knew that the enemy is at the gates all the time, and so you've always got to have that guard up. You got to have your shield, your shield on, and your 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 helmet of salvation, your 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 loins girt. I mean, everything's got to be there. So, uh, ba 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 ba. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, which I don't see how anyone could say that Jesus is not God. I mean, this is I mean saying that Paul says that Jesus isn't God is kind of a stretch, guys. And um, the the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the, unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up to glory. Now, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. And that's just, and that, that is the man of sin, that hypocrite. The one that you're, you're, so you might have the Bible and you're reading it from the physician, you're from, the, from a hypocrite, and then you, you, you disannul everything that's in the scriptures. Everything that you read falls to the ground. Okay? So, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, which I don't see how the Catholics can't see this right here, and commanding to abstain from meats, and that's like certain, like, like say, Seventh-day Adventists or people that are still doing this, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you shall be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto you have attained. But refuse profane and old wives' tables, fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise is profit little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Okay. Here's going to be the, the, the atomic bomb on, on anyone that thinks that, that, uh, that there is some sort of limited atonement or something. Uh, you're crazy. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all expectation. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. And then they're like, well, no, it's just talking about those that believe. No, then you go one second later, it says especially of those that believe. It doesn't mean limited to, it just means especially those that believe, and so that we have great comfort, those of us who believe, and reassured unto our holiness in the Lord. So that we, it's just it's just Paul reassuring, reassuring, reassuring the saints. Because if they've been reconciled, how much more have we that actually believe, you know? These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, Patrick. <laughs> but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, and in faith, and in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given by the prophecy in the laying on the sons, or laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate, uh, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly unto them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in, so, in doing this you shall both save thyself and them that hear you. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, to the elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters, and with all purity. Honor windows, widows that are widows indeed, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them first learn to show piety at home, and to require requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Uh, now, and it means to go home and serve her parents. She needs to go home and become valuable to her parents. Serve her parents is like she was going to serve her husband, right? Now that she is a widow indeed and desolate, trust is in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken in the number into the number under threescore years old, being sixty years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has re relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking of things which they ought not. 
I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned after, aside after Satan. And this is very, very tempting. Women, it's it, it's because of Eve, and because women desire that safety, and it's really, if they don't get it from men or from home, they will, they'll try to control their circumstances, and they'll trust Satan. He'll promise them the world, but lie to this, through, their te- through his teeth. Um, if any man or woman that believe have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And this again, I can see here that this is true. And he says it before that, you know, in Thessalonians, he says, None, that you should work for yourself. Don't be dependent upon anyone else. But it's true that if you want to support others, you're welcome to do that. But it should be willingly, not begrudgingly. Okay. Against an elder, okay, and against an elder, re, re, receive not an accusation, but both for two or three witnesses. Them that sin, rebuke before all that others may fear. And again, somebody says, "Well, you're sinless." Well, the thing is, yes, we are. We we keep that conscience before God in our relationship, but we can sin one against another, and we are going to try to spur each other on to good works. We uphold we uphold good deeds and make sure that people are blessing each other. If someone is injurious to another, it would be really bad of us not to step up and punish that person. We, we have to understand, we have that authority, okay? I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without preferring one another before another. Do nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Treat no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine, own, thine often infirmities. See, and this is kind of funny about, you know, you know, is Timothy, uh, you know, all these guys, Epaphroditus, Epaphras, they're all sick, remember? They've been sick at certain points. I mean, just the, the doctrines we hold today are like so stupid. Like if, you know, sin, sickness belongs to sin. If you're sinless, you shouldn't be sick. It's like, you know what? God allowed these men to get sick. Timothy was get, got sick. Paul had an issue with his eyes. Freaking uh, that one dude almost died. He was sick unto death, Paul said. Epaphras or Epaphroditus, whatever his name is. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest before, some, uh, before, and the others they cannot be hid. Let as many servants are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of the, the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. And this is again, you know, everybody's all worried about slavery. God's not. He's talking to the slave, saying, "If you're a slave, honor your master." And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereunto comes envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, supposing that to gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. And this is like, I mean, this is a, this is hammering on everyone that is arguing about all these stupid, worthless, futile things. And then over here, down here, is the, the godly that those that think gain is godliness. That's your all your freaking prosperity doctrine preachers are hammered right there, right? But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therefore content. And that's like, we're here so rich. I mean, compor- com- compared to the worldly standards of all time in, in, in history, we are like, we're, we eat better than kings right now, of old, you guys. We are so wealthy, so blessed. But they that will be, that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. It is not, you know, those that want to be rich. Many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while some, while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, which is the third soil, right? One of the third parts of the third soil. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness, which are the greatest gifts in the world, by the way. People search their whole times, gather riches to themselves, marry over and over and over again and search for these things that God just gives us freely. We don't need all those things. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on to eternal life, whereunto you are also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. And this is right here. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. 
I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickens all things. Again, there's the fifth location. It bring, quickens every, quickening all things means brings everything to life. That's what it means. Before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that you keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, which in his times. Okay. Who only has immortality, which is the only thing that's not futile, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. So you cannot compare yourself to him. You can't compare yourself to anything because you've never seen him. To know whether or not you're going the right way or the wrong way, you have to trust his word. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in certain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. They that do good, they that be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on the eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Faith, grace be with thee. Amen. So, First Timothy is a is a death blow to all the modern theology there is. You know, I've heard I hear parts of Timothy read out of context. They don't read everything because they know it'll put a chink in their argument. If they read the next line, it's like John three sixteen. Nobody reads John three seventeen. If they read John three seventeen, it's a it's directly contradicting the way that they uh, interpret John three sixteen. You know, and you're just going, and it's like everywhere you go, you look at Hebrews nine twenty seven, as it is appointed unto men to die, one, and then the judgment. You know, everybody takes that one way out of context. If they read the next line, they'll see it doesn't mean what they've been told it means. You know, anyway. My brothers and sisters, um, I know I've been putting out a lot of videos lately, and uh, but I just I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you, Mike, for yesterday coming in. He's Mike's gonna be with me next week, and we're gonna have another um, another show. Um, if anyone wants to join in us, join with us. Let me know on Discord or whatever. Um, and uh, you know, I talk on the phone with with Pat and Mike and Nick. You know, Pat Golden. Um, if anybody wants to ever get a hold of me on the phone, I can't really talk to ladies. My wife gets a little buttered about that. But all the dudes I can talk to all the time. But if it's in a group, I could probably talk to ladies. Um, but, yeah, they, it's just my wife's, you know, she's jealous. And I'm like, why? She's like way more beautiful than me, right? <laughs> Although I am quite the catch. You know, I can see why she'd be afraid. But anyway, um, you guys are a blessing to me in every way. Um, Nick. Thank you for always being around, being my buddy, always on the phone with me and Mike, and you know. And thank you, Rob, for just just you know keeping everybody in line and keeping everybody fed. And Eon Monk, thank you, buddy. I need to get your name. You're really you're tearing it up on Discord. I love it. And uh, Kim and Kelly, thank you as always. And you know we have. It's kind of easy to remember everybody's name because we have two Pats, two Patricks. We have two Robs. We have you know what I mean. So it's kind of fun. So anyway, you guys, uh, just thank you for all that you're doing. All right. God bless you and your families. Talk to you soon. Bye.